James Carfriston. I'm a professor of neuroscience at University College London. And the title of my talk is going to be How the Brain Makes Predictions. The story here really starts with Plato um, and can be followed through via Kant to people like Helmholtz in the 19th century. But I want to start in the 16th century with this oil painter famed for painting still lives, that when viewed from a different perspective, give you a very different visual impression. So if previously you saw a bowl of fruit and now you see a face, the point he's making here is that you made that face. The idea is that the brain is a constructive organ. It actively generates explanations, fantasies, hypotheses that best explain the sensory impressions that we gather with our eyes. Literally, the brain is a fantastic organ, generating fantasies, explanations that best account for the sensorium. And this idea is probably best articulated by Hermann, Hel Hermann Helmholtz. For example, objects are always imagined as being present in the field of vision, as would have to be there in order to produce the same impression on the nervous mechanism. So again, what he's saying is that you have to have them in your head in order to explain, perceive, synthesize what could possibly have caused the impressions on your sensory epithelia, your retina, your eyes. And this idea is clearly very closely related to the notion of perception as hypothesis testing by people like Richard Gregory. Again, appealing to this notion that the brain is a constructive organ, and almost a statistical organ, a prediction machine that's generating hypotheses and then using sensory data in order to test those hypotheses, much like uh, a scientist would use empirical data to test her in hypotheses. Indeed, this whole story about how we make predictions and how we navigate our sensed world means that all of us are little expert scientists testing hypotheses about our lived world. And these ideas have been taken forward um, to great effect by people like Geoffrey Hinton and Peter Diane, formulating this notion of the brain as a predictive machine in terms of Bayesian probability theory, borrowing or inheriting from the work of people like Richard Feynman on um, variational formulations of solving the difficult inference or measurement problem that is faced by the brain. So let's go back to Helmholtz and this notion of impressions on the nervous mechanism. So what I've cartooned here is a shadow on our sensory veil, a shadow on our sensory epithelia. If it's right that we have to explain the causes of these sensory impressions, it means that I'm going to have to find an explanation for what caused these particular shadows. Is this a leap or is it something else? So how might the brain actually do that? We have quite a lot of mechanical understanding of how this process might be working in our in our heads. I'm going to frame this in terms of something called predictive coding. Um, in engineering, it would be known as Bayesian filtering. There are many ways of understanding this. Um, I, you can understand it mathematically, and I've written down here a mathematical summary of the processes that we have in mind. Um, mu here stands in for some mean or expectation about the cause of my sensations, some cause about the states of the world, the states of affairs out there beyond my sensory organs. And the dot means it changes. So the rate of change of my neuronal representations, my expectations about the world is effectively a dynamic driven by the imperative to minimize free energy. And this is Feynman's uh, free energy. What is this free energy? Well, effectively, it's a prediction error. Um, so I've written it down exactly the same equation, exactly the same Bayesian mechanics in terms of what, if you were an engineer, you'd understand as a 
um, Kalman filter comprising a prediction. Given I have some expectations or beliefs about the state of the world, I also have beliefs about how it will change, so I can predict what I will see in the next moment of time. And what I actually register with my sensory organs, I can now use to update my prediction to effectively track what's going on in the world beyond my sensations. So what's this prediction error? Well, just by comparing these formulas, mathematically, it's actually the gradient of this free energy function of my sensations and what I believe was causing my sensations. More heuristically, though, imagine we have this sensory impression on our eyes. Imagine further that I had this belief, this expectation that this was caused, this pattern was caused by a howling dog. And if I had a generative model of what I would see if I was correct, I can then predict what I would see, subtract it from what I'm actually seeing, and the remainder is the prediction error. So the prediction error is just the mismatch or the difference between what I'm sensing and what I predict I would be sensing under some particular expectation or hypothesis about the causes of my sensations. And all this equation is saying is that we're using this prediction error to drive changes in our expectations encoded by brain or neuronal activity in order to eliminate the prediction error. And if I can fully explain this pattern of sensory impressions, then I have a good enough explanation for what caused that pattern. Now notice, I will never know what actually caused the sensations. In this instance, it was a cat and not a dog, but that doesn't matter. If I can minimize my prediction errors throughout life, then job done. This notion of minimizing free energy or prediction error, I think is very useful and very nice because it gathers together both perception and action in the service of both trying to minimize prediction error. So there are two ways of minimizing prediction error. I can either literally change my mind through neuronal dynamics and evoked neuronal responses given some sensory inputs to make my predictions more like my sensations. However, there is another way of minimizing prediction error. I can actively resample the world to make my sensations more like my predictions. And by resampling, I mean visual palpation, moving my eyes from here to here to change the sensations, touching things in a different way, changing channels on the television, committing to different social media, searching for the kind of sensory impressions that I predict that I would see if I was right about the world. Um, and what we'll see in the moment, this is a fairly simple description of how we actually move. Basically, we move in order to fulfill our predictions. So let me make that slightly more um, concrete uh, by appealing to um, vision and eye movements, ocular motor behavior. Um, here's a cartoon of a brain in which I've written out that Kalman filter, that predictive coding like scheme in terms of prediction errors and predictions encoded by pyramidal cells or certain kinds of brain cells uh, here in blue and in red. So let's consider visual information coming in from the retina, arriving at a subcortical nucleus called the lateral geniculate nucleus, and it will be in receipt of top-down predictions. And the difference can then be used to elaborate a prediction error that is then sent forward to revise and update my expectations, my Bayesian beliefs about the elemental causes of these visual inputs. But of course, these predictions are themselves predictable. So I can have a secondary cortical or visual area that's trying to predict the predictions. And of course, I can have a secondary prediction error that then is used to revise my higher order beliefs and so on to any desired hierarchical depth, literally building deep generative models, world models apt for generating the right kinds of predictions in a cascade such that we have 
descending top-down predictions that are trying to explain away the bottom-up ascending prediction errors. Let's now consider another kind of input, the kind of input that, say, would come from the muscles in my eye, reporting how my eye muscles are stretched, and this is called proprioception, um, and it may arrive, generate signals, sensations that arrive in the pontine nuclei, and that those um, sensations could have top-down predictions. And I could use the ensuing prediction error to revise my beliefs about where I'm looking, where my, where my eye is currently pointing. However, there's a much simpler way of eliminating this kind of proprioceptive prediction error. I can use the prediction errors and return them back out into the world to actually drive the muscles so that they contract, so that they generate exactly the signals that I predicted. That's just a description of a classical reflex arc. And that presents an interesting picture. It means that my top-down predictions of how I deploy my muscles, my actuators, my autonomic reflexes, now provide set points that are fulfilled through either motor reflexes or autonomic reflexes, making my predictions come true. Now, notice how simple this is, a very simple closed loop peripheral kind of action upon the world. And yet it is deeply informed by an open loop, hierarchical gathering of information from all sorts of modalities just to generate the right kind of predictions that determine how I will actually move and act upon the world and actively gather the kind of information that I need in order to um, minimize my prediction error and uh, make the right kinds of predictions. So I just want to illustrate the sort of behavior that you can simulate using that predictive coding scheme in a computer, um, just to show and make a particular point here that perception is not passive. Perception and prediction is an active process, both in the sense of actively constructing in an inside out kind of way, as Andy Clark would say, um, the causes of my sensations, but also acting upon the world so that it generates the right kinds of sensations that I predicted. And in some instances, we can actually write into the world causal structure that we in ourselves actually generate, even though um, it just requires a prediction, very much in the spirit of um, 19th century ID motor theory. But let me give you a final example of that. Um, what we did here is this build a little agent, um, and we equipped this agent with the belief that there was some dynamic going on inside her head. And this particular dynamic you can think of as a central pattern generator. Mathematically, it was based upon something called a heteroclinic cycle. The details don't matter. The construction of this, though, is um, quite important. So given this arbitrary central pattern generator, it is now mapped to and predicts in the agent's head the movement of an invisible point in extrapersonal space. Furthermore, the agent believed that her finger was attached with an invisible spring to this point. So from her point of view, she expects and predicts to both see and feel her finger being moved around. And this is what you're seeing down here in this little movie here. Reproducing from the point of view of an observer, movements that look very much like handwriting. But from the point of view of the generative model, all we're doing is fulfilling predictions. So the predictions of how she should feel her hand move are being automatically fulfilled through reflexes. And of course, those movements that ensue from the reflexive control generate the visual pattern that she expected to see. And then we can look at the synthetic or simulated neuronal responses. So here, what we've done is plot the activity of neuronal or brain cell populations encoding the central pattern generator and showing when the activity of one of them is higher than half the threshold. And we plotted it as a function of um, where the finger was actually pointing. 
And the reason for this is just to demonstrate a number of characteristic responses that one sees in real brains. In this instance, say a place field like activity that is restricted to certain locations in extra personal space. There's a direction selectivity. This particular cell or population uh, prefers the downward stroke of the J as opposed to the upward stroke. The other nice thing about this simulation is that we can remove the ascending prediction errors from the hand, from the muscles. So from the point of view of the agent, it's as if the visual input has been caused by somebody else because she can't feel herself moving. Clearly, she's got the right apparatus, the right prediction mechanisms, the right prediction sh machinery in order to explain and predict the visual input. But it would be as if somebody else is actually performing the same movements that she once generated. Uh, and in the neurosciences, this is you know, effectively a very simple simulation of action observation, as opposed to actually causing your own sensations by acting upon the world. You're now observing somebody else causing the same kind of sensations using exactly the predictive uh, machinery, speaking to the notion of a mirror neuron like um, dynamics in our head where we're just repurposing our predictive machinery in order to explain exactly the same dynamics and outcomes but in a slightly different context and in this instance the context was the inference of agency. So that's it, that's one very simple and I think compelling account of how our brains make predictions um, I'm going to summarize and give the last word back to the author of many of these ideas, namely Hermann Helmholtz. Each movement we make by which we alter the appearance of objects should be thought of as an experiment designed to test whether we have understood it correctly, the invariant relations of the phenomena before us, that is, their existence in definite spatial relations. Mm -hmm.